starts the recording. Yay. I have to call somebody over at Blackport Support and find out what in the heck have happened to my breadcrumbs up here. It's driving me crazy. Every time I come back in here, when I've gone somewhere, my breadcrumbs disappear. So I have to go back and start it all over again. Wait for it to load in. Drives me crazy. Or maybe I should say. We, we are rapidly finishing this up. We spent a lot of time with understanding by design, uh, which I think is appropriate because it forms the shell around which we do this final for this class. And so last week, we spent a lot of time talking about this thing, this uh, short version of the lesson plan. And then we spent a lot of time looking at how to do this thing, the storyboard that. Remember, all I said for you to do is just to complete the storyboard that and then copy those links and put that into the live text. And then I asked you to do the storyboard, excuse me, the lesson plan form that's in the live text. Just go ahead, take a swing at it. But if you're smart, you'll make sure that that lesson is going to look like <clears throat> look like the other four that you are going to create. I was asked today by someone, are we following the K-TIP lesson format here? No, no. You are following the Wiggins and McTeague lesson format here. So that your established goals, what is it we're trying to do as we start this journey? Where are we going? Your enduring understandings straight out of the core content. The essential question is what you come up with. Knowledge, what do kids need to know? Skills, what will they be able to do? Assessment instruments or evidence, excuse me, performance tasks. What are they going to do? This is where the five facets of understanding could fall. And any other evidence. And then down here, a learning activity, which usually when we see these, this is where we see the technology. And it's down in here. Now, for those of you who are using something like a Google Classroom, please realize that that can be everywhere in here. Because you put a lot of stuff into the Google Classroom. So that could be your whole focus. Um, the kids will use the Google Classroom to do X, Y, and Z. What I'm trying to get you to realize is this is not hard. Pretty straightforward stuff. Tonight, what I want to focus on before we actually, uh, next week, we'll sit here and take a look at all the different kinds of uh, tools that we could employ uh, for understanding that use technology. I'm going to do one last sort of curricular thing, framework thing. And that is about universal design for learning. I am a true believer in UDL. I am frankly not a true believer in the whole Tomlinson differentiated instruction stuff. For the very simple reason that how can I do differentiated instruction with 28 kids? I can't. What I can do is I can design learning that allows for everybody in the class to participate. That's a much easier task. And that's what universal design for learning is all about. I'm going to, and you know how much I hate uh, PowerPoints, but I'm going to run one just for a little bit because I want you to see some of the most important pieces. And then what we'll do is we'll take a look at the um, assignment, which is very straightforward, fairly easy. But normally, if you were sitting here in the room with me, we would start here.
UDL is kind of bound up in a lot of things. One of those things is Howard Gardner's learning styles. So right here where I'm sitting, you can see a link there that says learning styles test. Now this was extremely popular about 15, 10 to 15 years ago. In fact, it became almost the pickup line. So uh, what's your learning styles? And what are you doing in a bar like this? It became that ubiquitous. I don't know if after all these years that it still holds the same water that it did back then. And the reason why I'm telling you this story is if you take this learning styles test, well, let's pull it up so you can see it. If you take this test, it's going to look at you through different ways of seeing the world. And I don't know what just happened here. wonder why it did that. Let's close that and try that again, shall we? Learning styles test now. Well, that's a shame. Let's see if there's a link here that will take us somewhere. Ah. Well, you don't have to take the test. We just did this. Uh, Monday night. So the learning styles test, I can explain it to you. It broke people down into certain categories. Linear mathematical, linguistic, naturalistic, musical, kinesthetic, interpersonal, and intrapersonal. Now, no one of us is one all the way. We're a mixture. We're made up of all different kinds of ways of seeing and understanding the world. I'm a kinesthetic learner. I like to have my hands on stuff. I like to take stuff apart and see how it works. I'm also a visual spatial learner, which is very ironic when you think that I'm legally blind. But if I can get close enough to see it, my eyeballs just gobble it up and it immediately transmits it to my brain and my brain forms a picture and I carry it around in my head. Kind of goes well with being a kinesthetic learner. There are some of us who like to sing while we're working. There are some of us who can't keep our feet still, like when you're trying to study and think. You know, and you could say, well, that's kinesthetic or that could be musical. Could be both. The point of all this is, and this is kind of where our hero for the evening, Dr. David Rose, kind of steps in, is that we need to understand that we all have different ways of approaching the same problem. And instead of trying to squeeze everybody into this one little round hole and drive that square peg into it, if we allow people to approach a task in multiple ways, I don't have to create the task in multiple ways. This is where I draw the line between UDL and, and uh, Tomlinson. I don't have to create the task in multiple ways. I have to allow for the student to approach the task in multiple ways. Here I go, I'm going to tell you a story. I have a uh, dear, dear friend. You know, that classic brother from a different mother. And I've known my dear, dear friend for a very long time. When I was a special educator, my claim to fame was uh, that I worked really, really well with children with Down syndrome and children who were on the autism spectrum. And so when this friend of mine had a son who was born with Down syndrome, and he came to me and literally, literally held me in his arms and cried and said, you've got to help me save. You've got to help me save. I want him in your class. That kid wasn't even old enough to be in a class. But I, along with another lady by the name of Mary Carter, started a program here in Jefferson County Public Schools that eventually led to something called Down Syndrome of Louisville. Um, after I left to become a classroom teacher 
And Mary retired. A wonderful woman by the name of Jean Bryson took over, whose son that I was very honored to have taught. But get back to my friend. And I told him, I said, your son will go as far as you will let him. Your son will go as far as you will let him. So if you start buying into, well, they can't do this. Or the more humane way that people think of saying that, you know, it's not their fault. He bought that. And they fought for their son to remain with his classmates all through elementary school, all through middle school, with support. In other words, you're going to do the same work as everybody else, but we'll have support to help you break that work down so you can have it in chunks that you can accomplish something. So now here he is. He's in high school. And he asked his parents if he could be in an AP American history course. He loved American history. You can, you'll go as far as you let him. So in this course, the instructor, good guy, talked to the parents and he said, I, I don't mind him being in my course. He's, he's quiet and he uh, pays attention and he um, contributes. And once I've learned his sort of speech pattern, he said, I enjoy him. He said, now, when it comes time for the big research project that they'll have to do, um, we won't, he won't have to do it. He'll go as far as you let him. His parents said, no, he'll do that research project. If you will allow him to pick a way to do it that suits his strengths. And he said yes. So the project was that the students had to pick a slice of American history. In other words, they had to be able to say from this point to this point. And it had to then focus down on a topic that was germane to that part of American history. So you could imagine some folks did Jim Crow laws, some did integration, some did uh, Western expansion. You, you can guess what some of those might have looked like. David's was the story of jazz in America. If David had taken Gardner's learning styles test, he would have come out so far on top of musical it wouldn't even be funny. as well as visual spatial. So what he did is he made a concordia of jazz music from its inception until 1950. And he drew that line because he said at 1950 is when rock and roll came in and ruined everything. <laughs> I always found that interesting. The, the fascinating part about it was he did as much work, he did as much in-depth work as those people who made those 20-page research papers. My argument would go like this. Why would we devalue what he did over what someone else did? Why would we even compare it? He demonstrated his understanding. He completed the task in a way that allowed his abilities, intelligences, ideas to shine through. So universal design for learning has a very strong place in my heart. Here's the other thing I like about universal design for learning. There's real science behind it. This isn't just a bunch of liberals all sitting around holding hands and singing Kumbaya, as I'll show you here in just a minute. There's real learning science that goes behind it. And this is something I always had a hard time for my parents to understand when I was working with special needs kids, especially kids that are speech delayed. And I would say to them, look, the only thing that's delayed here is in the ability of the facial muscles 
to come together to form words. The ideas are there. The conceptualization's there. If someone has talked to this child, if someone has read to this child, if someone has played with this child, if someone has taken this child to places and let them enjoy the rich world they inhabit, it comes. And it comes in gangbusters. All we do is we put up roadblocks. We don't mean to. We do it with all the best intentions in the world, but we put up roadblocks. Speaking of roadblocks, UDL has a very long storied history. Let's do that real fast. The Americans with Disability Act was passed originally as a way to make buildings accessible. It had nothing to do with education. It had everything to do with making physical barriers blocks to be taken away so that people who had physical disabilities or like me, who had visual disabilities, a way to be able to maneuver in this world. With the advent of the IDEA law, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, we then saw that that idea came into education and brought with it all the layers of bureaucracy that we all who are special educators have to do, which is a shame. Because the original idea was, open the doors, let's welcome everybody in. And what we have to realize is that the child is not disabled. The child is not broken. It's the curriculum. And if we can see our way around to come up with ways that everyone can participate, not just the special needs kids, but everyone. Then the changes we make for the few benefit the many. Is that simple? Now let's get back to that science part. So Dr. David Rose is a professor of neuroscience at Harvard. And one of the things that has always fascinated him is learning. How do we learn? How do we understand things? And I'll be quite honest with you, this is something that always fascinated me too. And I loved working with my special needs kids for a whole bunch of reasons. But one of the reasons why I really, really loved working with my kids was I could see the learning. You know, when you when you watch in a in, in a classroom, you'll see the kids who have learned how to hide their misunderstandings really, really well. Or they learn strategies so they don't have to acknowledge the fact they they don't understand. And you know what I'm talking about. My kids wore their misunderstandings on their sleeves. And so it was so obvious where the disconnects were that we were able to plug in and help. So what David was fascinated by is how do we have access, participation, and progress in the general education curriculum for all learners? And he knew that he had to show that there was more alike here than different. As I said, it all started with the ADA Act where we were talking about how do we make accessibility a norm instead of an exception? How do we make it so that people can participate in society and the community as the accepted norm, not the exception. And now, and now my friends, it has gone to the point where when you walk into a Kroger store, you walk into Home Depot, you walk into Lowe's, the signs are bigger. You know what I'm talking about. The aisle signs, I'll tell you what's down. They're bigger. You go into the airport, those stupid monitors that used to hang so high up on the ceiling, 
are now down lower in their LCD panels and they're much bigger. I was at my Stony Brook Kroger when it was getting blown up. I'm sorry. When it was getting redone. And I caught a Kroger exec walking around. He had a coat and tie on and a clipboard and a big fancy Kroger pin on him. And I asked him, I said, let me ask you something. I said, I've noticed that the signs in the grocery stores are getting bigger. Why is that? And he looked at me and he laughed and he said, we're getting older. You know, we don't think about aging as an exceptionality until we know someone who is. But then for someone like me who has a very specific exceptionality, legally blind, the fact that you're now making those signs in those stores big so that all the old folks who are walking around in there can now read them. Thank you. That's UDL. Now I can go in a grocery store. I know this sounds silly, almost childish, but I can go in a grocery store. I can find the stuff in the store. I don't have to have someone with me who could read this, who could read the little signs. It's those little steps. It's those little slights that happen to kids all the time. They may not have a physical exceptionality. Their exceptionality, we're going to see here in a second, David's going to show you. Their exceptionality might be that they have a, lot, a, a severe deficit in experiential activities. No one ever read to them. Heck, no one ever talked to them. Never went anywhere. If we can acknowledge that and then plan for ways to help kids with that. So we do things for the benefit of the few to the benefit of, of the many. All right. So let me take you through this. In his work with brain research, what David found was that UDLs and educational learning assessment and drawing on new brain research, he found that because of the new imaging tools that we had, he could isolate where things were in the brain and how they worked. Take a look. So we have the learning brain, which he divides into three networks the recognition network, strategic network, and affective network. Not the effective, the affective network. And what he found was, and how did he do this? What he found was when people were shown things where they had to recognize what they were, or they had to make connections about what they were, certain parts of your brain lit up. And there it is. You see those two parts of the brain that lit up there? And what this part of the brain is, is for is for the harvesting and holding of that incredible amount of information that we get as we grow up. The exciting part about it is that this is a very malleable part of your brain. In other words, it's very plastic. It's very, it can change very easily. But look what else is that part of the brain. Right there. Here's where all your recognition and all that stuff you store in your head. It's right above the fight or flight part of your brain. This part of your brain is where this can get triggered real easily. You hand a kid an assignment. You open the textbook to page 48 and the kid looks at that and Oh my God, I have no idea what I'm looking at. Or, oh my God, the words are swimming in front of me on the page. Fight or flight. Right there. Now, I'm not going to go through this little part of the exercise where you look at a picture and you talk what you see. Let's just keep going through this. Strategic part of your brain. 
Strategic networks are the how of learning, how we plan, execute, and monitor actions and skills. This is where, this is where I think we need to focus a lot of our attention in education early on. We need to be teaching kids how to organize, how to strategize, how to think through a problem. I remember sitting and watching a K-TIP teacher at a high school where she was teaching in a business class how people in entrepreneurial ways problem solve. In other words, an entrepreneur basically says, I think there is a need for X. How do I go about creating that and getting that? And her kids were stuck, high school kids. They were stuck. They didn't know the steps to problem solve. She backed the truck up. They took the next two weeks of understanding, role playing, doing simulations on how to problem solve in a business framework. Now, this wasn't problem solving in the big world. This was business framework. And then she brought in some ent entrepreneurs. And she did that because she wanted her kids to have the opportunity to say, well, how did you solve for the problem of? How did you figure out how to? And she wanted them to hear from these folks who actually had gone through it so she could validate the process. Now, let's go back the other way. Let's go back down to the lower grades. If we could help kids by teaching how to organize themselves before the task starts or the teaching starts, then when we get ready to go into the task, Everything's waiting. It's all set and ready to go. You know this. You know this as well as I do. You know the kid that'll sit there and dig through the crayon box for an hour instead of doing the work because they haven't beforehand thought about, so what colors am I going to need for this? And then they get lost in the crayon box. It's, it's one of those, when you think about it, it just makes sense. When I go in and watch good teachers teach, one of the things that I notice is they all have folders for every kid that comes through their door. And that kid goes, picks up his folder, and there is an order. There is a way that that folder is organized. That was taught from day one. And so kids know that when I'm done with this, it goes from this side to that side. Or there's a system in place, in other words. So that's the strategic side of the brain. And then the part of the brain that I hope we're all good at. And that is the affective side. What is it about that's going on in your learning that grabs your attention? What is it when you're looking at something that grabs your attention? What is it about hearing something that grabs your attention? You know that. You hear that song that is, you know, it's an earwig. It gets into your head and you can't get it out of your head. We know all about that kind of stuff. What is it that we do that grabs kids? I don't mean physically grabs kids. What is it that we do that intellectually grabs kids? It makes them want to sit and listen to you. Maybe it's because you do things with a sing-song voice. Maybe it's because you have a way of a similar speech pattern or a clapping of the hands. You have those sort of devices that you use to help get your class going. Sorry about that. So there you are. That's UDL. What the UDL says is that if we can recognize that these three parts of the brain have to be engaged before real learning can take place. And if we realize that people have different ways of approaching the same problem, 
And if we can allow them to do that, then we'll have success. Remember that guy? Skidovagotsky. One must recognize information, ideas, and concept. One must be able to apply strategies to process the information. One must be engaged. So David Rose has all this marvelous brain research, and then he found that guy. <laughs> Probably sitting in a bookshelf somewhere. And he went, oh, the crazy Russian wrote about this long before I ever got on the scene. But the point is, is all you have to do is you have to realize how we develop task. If the task is too difficult, what does that mean? Well, that means I don't have the prior knowledge to help me understand the present knowledge and task. Remember where that's located. Remember where that's located. Right above that fight or flight part of your brain. It has to be. Think about it. Evolutionarily, it has to be. Because when we were walking around in the grasslands in Savannah in Africa, and we would look around and we'd say, oh, what is that thing over there? Oh, look, it's running at us. Oh, look, it has fangs. Oh, crap, where's the nearest tree? Or let me pick up this rock and throw it at it. You see, you see, your brain, that part of your brain has to be connected to that fight or flight part of your brain so that it understands when the warnings kick in. It has a context for that. Now, I'm not saying that's what happens in schools, but I am here to tell you that I've seen too many kids who sit and look at the task in front of them, can't figure it out, don't have a strategy for figuring it out. And so the paper goes flying, the chair flips backwards, and they're free. Because you can't handle that in your classroom. I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I mean, we can't have kids throwing paper and throwing chairs around. If I can give the task so there's enough challenge in it, that the student has enough of the prior knowledge to it, that's where your rigor and relevance kicks in. We have high rigor, high relevance, we have engagement. And we all know about tasks being too easy. You get bored real fast. How does this fit? How does this fit with what we're trying to do here? We're trying to say that all learners are unique. The universal does not mean that one size fits all. It means that the exceptions for the few benefit the many. That's it. And I argue very strongly that designing curriculum that way is a heck of a lot easier than designing it I got to have 28 different lesson plans. If I can come up with a way that everyone can participate, then the products I get will be unique. But their uniqueness will be because they all represent the same idea, the same concept. Now, how does this fit in with what we're doing? So at some point in your design for your unit, what I hope that you will realize is, is that it's not hard to do this. And I'm going to go back a page here. I'm going to show you a tool 
that I have fallen in love with over the years. And the reason why I like this tool is for a couple of reasons. It's because I love the tool because it is such an easy tool for a teacher to use and to understand. It's such an easy tool for a teacher then to apply. In other words, put it somewhere. And then it actually does the, the job of universal design for learning. It speaks to the recognition part of our brain. This is what this thing is, and this is how it works. It speaks to the strategic part of the brain that I can then tap into. I can let kids watch a video. I can let kids experience information. And I can put myself into that and give them the heads up. Pay attention to this. This is what I was talking about in class yesterday. Do you see anything here that you don't understand? You have the ability to do all that. And you have the ability to put a formative assessment in there. You know, one of the great, one of the great things for learning is a concept called chunking. And I don't mean vomiting. Chunking, where we take the parts, or we take a part and we put it into smaller parts so that kids can have success. Then we come and we do the gestalt, we do the whole. Now, when I say that, I don't mean like 1,400 steps that the kids have to master. No. Steps can be made up of many, many steps, because what we're trying to do is to build neuron connection here. We're trying to get kids to start seeing the connection in things, not the discrete little bits, but the connections. That's the power of when you use media technology to learn with. So I'm going to show you the tool. I'm going to demonstrate the tool to you. And then I'm going to ask you for this particular part of it to create something using this tool. Now, you could use this something in your um, unit. In fact, you could put it in there like all five of the lessons, because if you think about what we're going to see here in a second, it could be germane to all five. Or it could be five different ones that represent different pieces, or it could be two, it could be three. But I also want you to realize this isn't the be all and end all, this thing we're going to show you here in a minute. Universal design for learning is basically allowing kids the ability to demonstrate understanding in multiple ways. It is a direct corollary, a direct echo of the facets of understanding from Wiggins and McTeek. All right, let me show you this cool, cool website. It's called Edpuzzle. You can use the Edpuzzle as me. And if you really find it has value, you can go in as me and create your own class and you can put your own kids' names into it. So if you want to get that granular with it, so that when kids do this work that we're going to create in this ed puzzle, you can actually get it to come back to you. And the other really cool things about it is it has hooks into the Google Classroom. So here we are, we're in ed puzzle. And I tell you, I'm going to log out just so you can see what it looks like. Here we are. Ed Puzzle, make any video your lesson, it says. So I'm going to log in, and I'm going to log in as the teacher. And I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to log in using that SB Swan 02 at louisville.edu with a password ULIT241. Okay? So sbswan02 at louisville.edu, password ULIT241. I'm going to log in. Now, if you want to look around, you'll notice over here that the people have been making classes. 
Um, we cleaned this out last year, so there used to be a lot more in here. We cleaned it out. I want you to look up here where it says content. I'm going to click on that. And once again, here is content. If you want to take a look at some of these things so you can understand how this works, there's some good examples right there. But let's go ahead and add our content. So I'm going to click up here where it says add content. And I'm going to create a video. Now, over here are all the different channels where you can find videos. So you've got the Ed Puzzle itself. You can find stuff that they have. You can use YouTube, Khan Academy, National Geographic, TED Talks, Veritasium, Number File, Crash Course. You've got all these different places to go look. I'll tell you what, I'll do the classic YouTube. I'm going to go old school here. You can see what some people have already gone in and looked at. Some good stuff here. But I'm going to go old school because I, I want the content to kind of fade to the background for process. So let's try this. Let's do adding fraction because you know what's going to happen. I'll get a million, maybe not a million but I'll get a lot of YouTube hits. And right away, what I want to do is I want to watch. I want to find that kind of video that will work with my kids. Now, looking down through here right away, some of these that have just the big numbers or whiteboards with numbers written on them, I don't know if that's going to work for my kids. And then you got this thing. Fractions is easy. Okay. What I'm going to be looking for are large, clear graphics because I know that what helps my kids learn best is when they can be presented with material with very minimal distraction that focuses down on what it is at the task at hand that I want to do. I'm going to try this one. I don't know. Okay, I, I really don't know. So I'm going to watch it. G'day, welcome to the Take Math channel. What we're going to be having a look at in this video is a way of subtracting fractions. From well, I don't know if I want that Australian voice. So maybe I'll walk away from that one and try to come up with another one. I'm telling you, I'm in this just as much as you are. Um, how about, okay, here's one. Adding fractions with unlike denominators. Well, let's, wait a minute. Let me jump down here. I think this is probably the same Australian guy. Oh, let's see what this one is. A little bit worried about the... I don't know about you, but I'm already going, where are the fractions in this? At first, I thought it was a little bit engaging and I was going to enjoy it. The second thing I did when I looked at it is I went, why is that guy sleeping on a couch? So I'm back to looking again. I love these where the person stands behind the glass wall. Drives you nuts. Okay, I'm, I'm going to have to grab something here. So I'm going to grab this one because it looks nice and big. 
I guess as far as your understanding of fractions, mixed numbers is helpful. But um, as far as operations with fractions, we're always going to want to convert. Yep, another guy right on the whiteboard. This is why I hate Khan Academy. I think it does not really adhere to any kind of real learning because it's just people writing on whiteboards um, and you're so busy looking at their hands that you're like, why would I do that? I mean, why would I pay attention to that? I'm going to give it one more shot. I'm sorry. And then I'll just move on. Let's try this one real fast. Yay. Please don't be a bust. Hi, guys. This is the fifth video from Zolvo eLearning. And in this video, I will tell you how to sum up or subtract two fractions. Okay, let's roll through here. And not bad. You know, we're, we're watching somebody draw. Okay. Hi, guys. This is the fifth video from Zolvo. I'm going to go ahead and drop out. I mean, I'm just going to use this, even though it's not the best in the world. But you can see what I'm doing here. I'm having to spend the quality time finding the quality video that meets my kids' needs. I need things big. I need things bright. I need things clear. So let's just go ahead and say, all right, we'll use this one. So I'm going to edit it. And now what I can do is the magic. So the first thing I can think about is I can crop the video. So I can go in after I've watched it a while and I can figure out where the important parts are. And I can move the start and the beginning bars to that piece. Now, obviously, I haven't done that. Look at that, man. I, I landed right where I wanted to be. The first step. So I'm going to go ahead and back that off just a little bit. And this is what I'm going to do. Watch. I'm going to come up here and add an audio note. When I add that audio note, what I'm going to have the ability to be able to do is to add my own talking as a way of helping kids with strategies. So I can come in here and I can click on that. And it's now recording my voice. This video is going to help us understand how to do, what was it, addition or multiplication of fractions. What I would need you to pay attention to is the different steps that he has to do to change how the numbers interact with each other. And that was a bad job. But the point is, I now have a way of dropping in and out of this thing and putting my voice into it. Let me show you what I mean. So let's go ahead and go back here and start from the beginning. Four plus 2 upon 9, and we have to calculate the results. So first step, let's go to the first step. First step is multiply these two numbers and write at the denominator, like 9 into 4, that is that. And, it, and it's now recording my voice. Now, six. let me sh talk to you about what my voice comes in a little late. That's okay. Because I can grab it and I can drag it so it comes in at the same time. Let's multiply these two numbers. So now what will happen is I and get in before he starts actually doing it. Lizards. So first step. Let's go to the first step. First step is that. And, it, and it's now recording my voice. Okay. So at this the point where he said first step. How to do, what was it, addition or multiplication of fractions. What I would need you to pay attention to is the different steps. Okay, so at this point, I have a way of interjecting and saying to the kids, hey, pay attention. From here on out, he's doing something that we need to be aware of. I can let the video play some more. Let's multiply these two numbers and write at the denominator, like 9 into 4, that is 36. Second step is cross multiply these two numbers and write as it is means 9 into 1 that is 9 here and 4 into 2 that is 8 here and what is between these two numbers that is a plus sign so plus sign so this two steps and the third step is stop and i want to drop in another note 
Did you notice here how he cross multiplied to get the numbers that he put into his problem at the end? And let's watch to see how he simplifies. Stop. Go. Uh, first of all, let me write the results. That is 9 plus 8, that is 17 upon 36. Now, the, the, the third step is to cancel out the common factor. There is no common factor. All right, I'm going to stop right there. You getting the idea? So you see, you can go through and literally add those ways of helping kids strategize what they're looking at. Pay attention to this. He's talking about that. Remember when we said in class, you can do all this inside of here. The last piece that's really cool is you can now add quizzes to it. And when you do that, it gives you a way to check for understanding. So now down here, I've got a little box that has a little question mark on it. Now, again, I can slide this anywhere I want in my video. So I'm, what I'm saying to you is make sure that you have watched the video so you know it kind of forwards and backwards. But so at some point, I can jump in here, click on my box, and I can now look at the question either as an open-ended question, multiple choice question, comment here. Look what you can do up here. So if I did this one, I now have a way of being able to put in uh, numbers with the various uh, mathematical symbols. If I wanted to put in a picture that might represent the idea of what's going on over here. If I need to put in a link that kids go to to help them to even to understand it even more, I can put that in as well. And so the whole YouTube video I have a way of chunking it, number one. I can use my cropping feature to basically come in here and say, look, the only important stuff that's in this thing is from here to there. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but at least I, I have the ability to be able to do that. Second, I can jump in and add my audio notes, and I don't lose anything in the, in other words, it doesn't take anything out of the video. It just adds my voice in there saying, look here, this is, this is important. What he's doing here is important. Did you hear him use the words denominator and numerator? Just like we talked about in class. It gives you a chance to bring your voice into the whole thing. And then finally, at the end, you have a way of putting in your check for understanding. Now, when you're finished, you can either assign it to a class. You can make some decisions about you can't skip through it. Or you can make it a public link. And there it is. So that would be the link that you could use. Or here's the embed code that you could use. And again, notice what you can do with that. You can come down here, you can make it nice and big so the Stevie Swans of your class can see it clearly. Or if you're in Google Classroom, just copy the link and put it in an assignment inside of Google Classroom. Now, I think this, the reason why I use this particular example is because I want you to see that the ideas behind universal design for learning are very simple. Fixing the curriculum so that everyone can participate 
making the curriculum so that it can be accessible by the few without any detriment to the many. It's such a simple, simple idea. And Edpuzzle is one of those really, as I said, I think I like it because it shows you all the aspects. Now, next week, what we'll do is I'm going to kind of go through uh, a laundry list here of a lot of stuff that you all have added. And I got more to add in here, by the way, that you all have added into this course over the years. And that is tools for the integration of technology into your instruction. And I wanted to just sort of do us a, a quick kind of, hey, this would be cool. This one's really cool. This one's really cool. This one's really cool. Um, that you could have access to. You know, I was t teaching a group of, ki of, of beginning teachers today. And I took them to the FET site. And they nearly fell out of their chairs because they couldn't believe how cool that was. And I think what we'll do next week is let's go through these and see where we would put them within the framework of the uh, lesson plan structure that we are using for this class. All right. Let me also, let's go forward because after next week we're done. Let's go forward from that and say and explain how we're going to do the rest. So what we'll do for your final is you have until the end of the semester. Please don't think you got to have all this done by next week. No, no, no. By the end of the semester, you're going to reach out to me um, and you're going to say, I would like to present to you my five lesson unit plan and I'm going to put this into a doodle. Do you all know what a doodle is? It's an online scheduling tool and I'll put this into a doodle and I'll let you be able to pick which Wednesday or Thursday because I don't have a class um, responsibility on Thursdays that you would want to then meet with me virtually inside of Collaborate, and what I can do is I can make you the moderator. In other words, I can make you me. And what you can do then is show me from your computer what you have designed, show me how the links work, show me what the material looks like, and then you just go into Live Text and put it all in there. And that's it. Now, let's see. Let me pop back in here. I don't know if Rachel and I are still the only people here. No, Kim's here. Kim! Hi, Kim! Okay. So, next week, we will take sort of the buffet view of all the different tools that are out there that we could possibly put in. Is there a... Is there a certain amount of tools that you want us to use steve no you find one tool say it again you find one tool that makes you sit there and smile about what it could do to facilitate development of what you are creating for this class you run with it i've seen people who have gone in and they've used the fet simulations that i just showed you and they've done it where they've had one FET simulation and they have put it all the way through all five lessons. But because each lesson asked the kids to do something different with that simulation, fine. You can use Nearpod examples as a way of enforcing the supplemental material that you want kids to learn. Unfortunately, Nearpod's gotten a little expensive, but you got me is the way to get into it. So again, you can get the links to put it into your curriculum, into your uh, unit, so it'll it can be a part of it. I'm going to uh, ask the two ladies who are here with me virtually if they have any questions. 
the rest of you and the great beyond, um, you know how to reach me with those questions. And that's 502-457-2937. You know, I feel like I'm doing a, a telethon when I, when I do this. I feel like I'm sitting here asking you for money. Rachel says she's good. Kim, how about you, Kim? Are you good? Kim's doing other things. All right. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. If you need, if you need me, you know how to get to me. As always, it's a joy being with you. And as always, you know how to reach me with any questions you might have. I'm getting ready to stop the recording.